Why do principles matter in the advancement of liberty? Join Richard Ebeling and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and welcome to this week's Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you all the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy and has for about 34 years. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you and our viewers and listeners. Yeah, Richard, so I, I just happened to be reminiscing about when we started the Future of Freedom Foundation some 34 years ago, our very first issue of our monthly journal, which at that time was called Freedom Daily and now is called Future of Freedom, came out in January of 1990. I had the lead article in that issue. You had the second article, and you were vice president of academic affairs for FFF when we got started. You really were a critically important factor in getting this thing going. At the time, you were the Ludwig von Mises professor of economics at Hillsdale College. Um, so I thought, you know, why don't we use this um, this particular libertarian angle to kind of go back to that that early time of FFF and, and specifically our mission statement, uh, because it was different. Uh, it was to present this principled case for the libertarian philosophy. We were rejecting all the reform positions that were coming out. Uh, I think the biggest one in the libertarian movement at the time was uh, school vouchers. I remember that was a big division. And um, one of our donors, you know, we're, those were difficult times for us, as you recall, financially. I mean, just struggling that first year. And there was, we had a thousand dollar donor at that time. And that was a big donation for us. Well, it still is, of course. But back then, you know, a thousand dollars is a lot. So he, he wrote me or called me. I can't remember which one. I think it was, he called me and said, I need you to do an op ed or an article on vouchers promoting vouchers. And I said, I can't do that. I mean, well, that's not what we stand for. You know, our whole approach here is to commit to principle, which means separating school and state. Vouchers involve a violation of the non-aggression principle, which is the core principle of the libertarian philosophy. It's not what FFF is all about. We're, we're here to raise people's vision to what genuine freedom is, not some kind of warmed over serfdom. And he got upset and says, I am insisting that you do this, this article. <laughs> and I said, well, it's just not going to happen. And he says, if you don't do this article, you will never get another donation from me again. <laughs> and sure enough, true to his word, we never received another donation. He, he didn't renew his thousand dollars and that was it. Uh, but I didn't have any regrets, Richard. I mean, this is what we did here at FFF. And same thing like with Social Security. I mean, Social Security is the crown jewel of American socialism and Medicare as well. And uh, there were schemes to privatize or to, you know, get um, people to invest in private retirement accounts that were government approved and so forth. In other words, he's kind of like, Rube Goldberg schemes to to save this system and make it work and not us. We said absolutely not. You know, we the only real solution is where one where from a freedom standpoint is where people keep everything they earn and they decide to do with their own money. Um, retire, I mean, use it to save or invest or donate or whatever. So I thought, why don't we go back to this issue, Richard, of why principles matter? You know, what is it that that elevates principle above, you know, pragmatism or practicality and that sort of thing. Um, because I believe that principles are everything. I mean, this, this is what we're trying to achieve a free society. That's really our goal. And um, when I discovered the libertarian philosophy, the big revelation for me was that I didn't really live in a free society. I mean, all my life I'd been taught that I live in a free society. And all of a sudden I discovered libertarianism and Man, the inches thick indoctrination is just cracking apart. And I realized it's all been li a lie. I've been lied to all this time. So I said, I want to be free. And so how do you achieve that free society? Well, I think the only way is through principle, by raising people's vision as to what freedom really is and identifying the infringements on freedom. You've got to identify the infringements on freedom, and then you've got to dismantle them. And the analogy I, I often like to use is slavery. 
that if we had spent all our time uh, or if people had spent all their time reforming slavery, fewer lashings, better health care, uh, better food and so forth, it would have it would have meant an improved slavery, but it wouldn't have been freedom. Freedom would necessarily entail a dismantling of the structure of slavery. And I think the same thing with respect to what I would say is our serfdom. I mean, uh, you know, you can you can call what we live under slavery, but it's, I think the better word is serfdom, where the, the government manages and controls our lives in various ways, the drug war and so forth. And uh, that the only way to achieve a genuinely free society is by sticking with principle and elevating people's vision to those genuine principles of freedom. What do you think? Well, I think that we this is, this is perhaps one of the most interesting, uh, yet for many people, uh, elusive questions. Why are principles important? And principles are important because they are a statement about how you think the world actually works. Uh, there are laws to nature. There's laws that can be discernible in the social order, uh, a natural order, if you will. And at the same time, there's a question of what is right and wrong. Uh, most of us would say that uh, kill or, killing another person uh, in a non-defense situation uh, is wrong. The taking of another human life uh, that it, uh, of a person who is not aggressing against you. Uh, that's also a presumption, right? The, the right of a self-defense. Uh, that we all commonsensically take it for granted that theft is wrong that that which someone has honestly produced or acquired through peaceful and voluntary exchange should be viewed as his and not molested in any way uh, merely because you want it or think that someone else could do, do better with it than the owner uh, and so on or fraud um, we all take for granted in our how we would want others to deal with us and presumptively with our dealings with them that we would not want to be lied to or cheated or deceived uh, as a subterfuge to get something from us that in a more honest setting of an exchange, we would not choose to do. So we all understand these general principles. And by the way, uh, the, uh, the German free market economist, Wilhelm Rupke, uh, referred to this uh, one time as anthropological constants. Uh, regardless of where you go to anywhere in the human race, while the context and the form obviously would be different in different societies and cultures, there are certain th presumptions that certain things are right and wrong. Uh, murder is wrong. Theft is wrong. Uh, deception is wrong. Uh, abiding by one's word is right. Uh, keeping one's promise properly understood is correct. And that uh, we would want others to respect us in these ways as they would want us to respect them. Um, now, if this is the case, then this goes back to the origins of the philosophical foundations of what is called classical liberalism or libertarianism to people like John Locke in his second treatise in government. Uh, uh, even before government, human beings have certain natural rights by their existence as, as, as a living rational creature. Of course, in his time, also, not just our reason would deduce this, but the rights given to us by God uh, to through the founders of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson, Madison, and so on, uh, through to uh, French writers like Frederick Bastiat, the free market classical liberal of the first half of the 19th century. Uh, all of these people would basically said is that certain things are true in nature about the condition of man, the nature of man, things that are necessary for his existence. In her own way, Ayn Rand and her philosophy, objectivism certainly uh, took this attitude that there's an objective reality and that there's a nature to man and requirements to man. And by derivation, what would be right and moral in human relationships. Uh, and that if this is true, then, and if we are to have a government, a government's role and purpose should merely to secure these agreed upon, principled, rights and wrongs. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. And false witness is just another way of saying no deception or or, or misrepresentation. Um, and if government's purpose is to do that, to secure our liberties from violations by private citizens, then surely the guardian 
should not be allowed to violate those rights as well. The government agents, the courts, the police, and so on. Uh, and therefore, the government has only one function, and that is to secure rights and not interfere or violate or, or, or infringe upon them. Now, if this is the case, and if one follows through with that, then government should not be redistributing wealth, regardless of the rationale and justification. Government should not be regulating or controlling or prohibiting voluntary and free consensual relationships between people, both inside and outside of the marketplace. Uh, it should not be undertaking foreign adventures and wars uh, in other parts of the world, uh, with national defense being no more than uh, the nation's version of a police force to interdict and prevent uh, criminal activity that is threatening our life and property, uh, but to do no more than that. And that therefore, the, 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 the range of government activity is very narrow, and the range of individual freedom and voluntary association is very wide. Now, the role of economics, I speak here obviously partly wearing my economist hat, uh, is that when the question is, yes, but if government only did that, how would the society function? And the, the beauty of the free society, uh, looking at how the world works, uh, sort of the natural social order, is that when uh, rights are protected, uh, property is secured, human relationships are based upon voluntary association, consent, and agreement, you have the potential for that interactive, spontaneous system, what Adam Smith became famous for calling the invisible hand, where in the pursuit of your own self-interest, the rules of the game being the only way you can benefit yourself in association with other human beings is by doing things that improve their circumstances as well as your own. Because if I can't kill you, if I can't steal from you, if I can't deceive you, then the only way I can get something that you have that I desire is by offering you something in trade that you want and value more highly than what I want you to trade to me. Now, in that setting, each individual pursuing their own interests are in that broad sense, improving the conditions of others in society. And therefore mutual benefit, a positive sum gain. And therefore there was a, a matter of ethical and moral principle. And it's a matter of creating a good society of, of freedom and justice and, and prosperity. There is no alternative to that principle of defense of liberty because every violation of liberty, every breaking of the principle or compromising of the principle in an inevitably and inescapably involves an infringement on one or more aspects of those principles of leaving individuals peacefully and freely to live their own lives, intruding into their actions, uh, compelling them to act or do things in ways they would not have freely and voluntarily chosen to, or prohibiting from them to do things that are not aggressions against others, but which then prevent them from doing things that they think would be best for their own circumstances in peaceful association with those others. Uh, and that's the importance of liberty. Everything else are encroachments. And the problem when you, you start violating these, Jacob, is that it establishes precedence. Well, you know, sure, you know what, what? We give a little bit of aid to this person in need through taxes by taxing others and infringing upon their keeping what it is. But it's just a little bit. But then there's another exception and another exception. And then there are vested interests that emerge uh, of those who are the recipients of these things and the politicians and the bureaucrats who are the conduits to make it possible. And suddenly you have this intricate spider's web of people who live off and gain benefits from and work within the systems of control, power, and manipulation that in fact make us in the end of the day poorer as well as making us less free. Yeah, well, you've raised a lot of good points. Um, one of the things that you reminded me of when you were talking about basic principles is you know, how people look at government differently when it does certain things as compared to the same things that are done by the private sector. In other words, if I go into a dark alley and accost somebody and rob them of $1,000 and then go and give it to the poor in a different part of town, I don't keep any of it for myself. I think 100% of people would say, Jacob, you've done something wrong. I mean, that, that what you've done is immoral. You've stolen. You've taken away his money. And I say, well, but I used it for the poor. Think of all the benefits I did for the poor. They were able to get food or help with their housing or their health care. No, Jacob, you stole. You didn't use your own money. But as soon as 
I go to the government, I go to the city council or the state legislature or the Congress and say, tax that person there in the alley a thousand dollars. And they do that. They go and collect the taxes and then they, they distribute it to the poor. The mindset of people is like totally different. Oh, how benevolent this is. Oh. And then if I object to it and say, no, this is just as wrong. Oh, Jacob, you are selfish. You're uncaring. You don't, you hate the poor, needy, and disadvantaged. And, um, so that's just sort of an example of the importance of principles here that, that hopefully people would be able to recognize that one is the same as the other. But here's another factor, Richard. Let's, just, let's assume that we've got this pure libertarian message and 100% of the citizenry look at it and say, we reject it. We don't, we don't like it. What do we do at that point? Uh, I think the response of some libertarians is, well, we don't have a choice. We have to just start watering down our message in order to get people to like it. And I, I think that's the absolute wrong approach. I mean, we don't have any control over how people believe or react to our message or whatever. That's their situation. The only thing we have a control over is what we promote and what we advance. And it's my position that even if 100% of the people said, we reject libertarianism. We've got to keep sticking with our principles. Uh, I mean, this is what effect effectively what Bastiat did. I mean, Bastiat, uh, yeah, he got elected in his home district to the to the parliament there. But by and large, France rejected Bastiat's concept of liberty. And yet Bastiat hung in there and just stuck with his principles. And he served as an inspiration for those of us today. Another factor on this methodology is, you know, I've, I've often heard over the years, how do we convince people to become libertarians? How do we construct our arguments to convince people? And you know, Richard, I, I'm convinced that you can't, you can't persuade people to be libertarians, that people have to figure this out for themselves. And I, and I really believe that there's a natural thing in certain people to be libertarians. I mean, there's just some of us that have broken through and achieved this breakthrough and realize that this glorious philosophy called libertarianism but others, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They don't even want to hear it. And you'll never convince those people. I mean, you couldn't walk into a, a, a place where people are just ardent status and think that you're going to sit in there with a three-day seminar and convince them that libertarianism is this great philosophy. It's just not going to happen. So over the years, I've decided that our, our real job is to find the libertarians, find the ones that are naturally attuned that don't realize they're libertarians and assist them in breaking through. And how do you break through? Through principles. I think principles are the only thing that can break through that indoctrination. That's what happened with me. If I had discovered a bunch of reform proposals or public policy proposals, and it would have not been powerful enough to break through this, this indoctrination. It's, it's the power of the principle that's able to crack open. And then when you find these people, then you encourage it and you nurture it and provide any guidance that they want, but essentially let, leave them free to passionately go out and start studying libertarianism, figuring out what it's all about. Um, but again, that, re that depends on the reliance on principle, just standing fast for these principles. And if you go back to our, our January issue of 1990 of, of um, Future Freedom, which is on our website, under Explore Freedom and our archives. That's essentially what we were saying, Richard, back there in that first issue, that that's what we were going to be doing here at FFF, presenting this principal case for liberty. I think that, you know, uh, well, back in 1942, uh, the famous Austrian-born economist, Joseph Schumpeter, wrote a book called uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And there's a part of the book in which he's trying to understand why is there this bent towards socialism? And he said that that too many of the intellectuals uh, have a built-in antagonism towards freedom for a variety of reasons. And as he put it, uh, th th those who are ready to uh, uh, deliver a verdict uh, already have uh, the, 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 the verdict in their pocket. Capitalism is condemned. Uh, all that the, the argument can influence is the indictment. Is it because capitalism oppresses the poor? Is it because capitalism harms the environment? Is it because capitalism creates inequality? 
the 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 charge may vary, but the, but 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 the but the end result of condemning capitalism is there. And there, there are some in society who, for whatever reasons, are ideologically opposed to liberty. So who in my do I think are we really talking to? You're not going to really persuade the ideologue on the other side unless there's some change within them. And there have been people on the left who have become more freedom oriented. Uh, people who had been strong communists, for example, back in the 30s and 40s and became at least conservative anti-communists, some libertarian anti-communists later on for various reasons. But you, you're not going to you're not talking to the ideologue. What you're, what you're talking to is the person who, who, who is overhearing the arguments, but doesn't know what to believe. Um, uh, Friedrich Hayek has this great essay on the role of, of the historian and politics. It's actually in this little book of his that he edited called Capitalism and the Historians. You can get this cheap on the internet, or I think maybe there's a DTF that's for free. But he basically says is that we don't realize that it's not economists, it's not philosophers per se, who really set the tone of the debate. It's historians. Because from the time we go to school and then we go to college, we take these courses and we hear things, oh, the Industrial Revolution oppressed the poor, made them even worse off than when they were happy little peasants in the countryside. Oh, capitalism causes wars. It's the base of imperialism and death and destruction. Oh, capitalism ma makes some handful rich while others are wallowing in poverty. Look at the record. Look at the history. Look at the wars. Look at... And our task is to in a revisionist fashion break these these mythical bubbles because if by doing so we put question marks in people's eyes head and 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 in in their ears now you're right the change doesn't happen until individuals do i totally agree with you but the point is how do you get someone to start thinking about this by making them suddenly hey i never heard that before oh Maybe that's right, not what I learned in school. And that's who we're trying to reach in the articles uh, that we that we write to a great extent, uh, to those we speak to before public uh, uh, forums of various types. Those who either don't know the evidence but feel freedom is right, or but lean towards the other side because they've never heard the principles or realize that history tells a different story. That is capitalism that liberated mankind from poverty, rightly understood, uh, and that's a, that's our audience. Now, it is true that, that by by reaching something that clicks in a person, you change them. You know, you mentioned that you know you can't make advocates of freedom; you try to find them. Well, that's a famous line from the the libertarian Frank Chodorov, a great essayist for liberty in the during the war and then in the post-war period. He said in one of his essays. The purpose of teaching individualism or libertarian philosophy is not to make individualists, but to find them. There's some spark in a person that if you can click it, but our task is education. And another thing that, that Hayek emphasizes, so I can just say this, is that uh, Hayek says is that the, 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 the relationship between ideas and policy is one with a lag. It's the intellectual milieu, the intellectual environment, the, 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 the climate of ideas that molds a generation, and then it affects policies 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. We're still immersed in the collectivist ideas of, of, the, of the 20th century, particularly the early and middle decades of the 20th century. Uh, government should own, government should plan, government should redistribute, government is good, freedom is bad, capitalism is, is awful. The, the, uh, and, and the historical ex mytho mythical examples they give of this. And that's what we're about, changing the climate of opinion to get little light bulbs and question marks go on in people's heads so that they will turn away from it. But that requires principle, as you're saying, Jacob. You know, as I like to say, no one jumps to the barricades and bears their chest before the enemy fire by saying, you know what? I want a voucher for my kid. I'm willing to risk life and liberty for a voucher or a 5% decrease in a tariff so I can buy something from abroad cheaper. Just 5%. Shoot me. No, people don't do that. They die for liberty, for principle. Slavery is unjust. 
controlling people as serfs or slaves is unjust freedom is good i want my child my grandchildren to be free from the oppression and the restraints that you have placed upon me and my ancestors so they can have a society of freedom and justice looking to the future that's why people bear their chest now people have bare open their shirts and bear their chest for wrong ideas as well as right ideas but unless a person is willing to believe that an idea is right they're not willing really to stand up for it and face the slings and arrows of misfortune not necessarily a bullet in the chest that's an extreme version but to stand up and say i don't agree with you this is why i think you're wrong uh, let me explain why i think that there's a different way of looking at reality and how the world works and what is good and bad that requires a degree of courage and willingness to stand up and you stand up for things when you believe that is right and right means a principle of what's right and wrong yeah well the the better way i heard you say it years ago that stuck with me was no one has ever gone to the barricades in history for the sake of a cost benefit analysis <laughs> it's true it is true i mean well you know uh you know i heard that that that, that the cost of this government program has a lower value than than, than the better oh no maybe a higher uh, 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 oh, shoot me i mean people don't do that <laughs> yeah and the the other thing richard that you pointed out is is people hearing these ideas or reading these ideas is is so important because in this process of finding people it's not an immediate transformation oftentimes you have to plant the idea we're sort of like johnny appleseed we're planting the idea and then the seed just germinates and finally just bursts asunder which could be two or three years later but it's got to be the sound idea that is let's take education for example if all you do is put the the idea in people's mind that school vouchers are the way to go nobody's going to think about getting rid of the state involvement in education their their entire mind is going to focus around will this voucher program work what will be the benefits of it what will be the consequences how much will it cost that's the entire focus while if you put into that person's mind the idea that hey separating school and state the way we separate a church and state he might be shocked by that my gosh get the state entirely out of education but once the idea is, is in his mind, you never know what then is going to happen to it. So, you, so that's the importance of principle. That's how you shift an entire society uh, toward freedom as compared to just some mild, warmed over serfdom. And then the other thing, Richard, is I remember Leonard Reed, the Foundation for Economic Education, used to have that little chart where it was a bell curve sort of. And over here were the, the bad ideologues and over here were the libertarian ideologues. And most people in the middle just didn't care They're kind of indifferent and so you know libertarians have spent all their time trying to focus on these people in the middle or wasting their time to a large extent they, they don't they don't they're not into this but over here if you can keep getting a few people into your camp that's how you reach a critical mass that shifts the people in the middle they finally say oh okay i'm just going to shift and, and the guy that really explained this well was W. Edwards Deming, the, the management guru who, who transformed Japan in the 1950s and 60s into this industrial powerhouse with his management techniques. And he said that, you know, to change the management philosophy of a company, you don't have to change the majority. You just got to get a critical mass. And then at some point, the entire company then just shifts. And I think that's that's where we're going in this country. I think libertarianism is reaching that critical mass that's going to bring that shift. But it's only yeah. done through principle. Yeah. And if people don't hear these alternative views, always presented reasonably, logically, respectfully, not in your nose, you're wrong, I'm right approach. I think it, the, a tactful respect for the other in the discussions is important. What that these they realize that in some cases these arguments even heard I, maybe some of the viewers and listeners have have heard in the press that recently uh, the, the 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 they have reformed a government in Northern Ireland uh, you know they're a pro uh, stay in the UK Northern Ireland Northern Ireland people people Catholics who would like to see unified Ireland no longer in you know just one. Republic of Ireland, including the North. And so after two years, they finally worked out their differences and they're going to have a functioning government again. So I was watching BBC News yesterday and today. And uh, 
What's the commentator saying? Finally, finally, they have a functioning government to do the necessary things that you have a government for. Why? Why there's educational matters and and there's public housing and you know the mindset is that's what government is for, to manage, control, redistribute, and plan. Now, imagine if 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 someone had had gotten up and said, instead, oh my gosh, they have a the political parties getting together, having a functional government. What a disaster! Why for two years they've not had a government. Admittedly, the bureaucracy has been sort of on an automatic pilot. That's bad enough. But you haven't had these politicians now back in the saddle imposing more of their nonsense. What if someone had just said something like that? Shake them up like we should we got by without the politicians. Maybe we can, maybe we don't need all those politicians doing this and take these bureaucrats off automatic pilot and reduce them as well. Get rid of them. You see, that would be a radical commentary. But you see, nobody says that. It's just presumable. This is what government is for. This is what government, this is why we want them. Now, if I can mention one thing here, because you were saying something earlier about, you know, people take for granted this is what the politicians are to do, and this is what government's for. Why? Well, you see, there was a time when governments were basically tyrannical in the literal sense. It could be the absolute monarch, it could be an oligarchy of noblemen, but it was the few presuming arrogantly to control the many. And the many knew that the few were attempting to manipulate and have power over them to, to extract wealth, to control their lives, to manipulate them, abuse them. So government was viewed as the enemy of freedom and prosperity uh, for everyone and their families. But the, the, the problem is that we then fell into a form of the, the myth of democracy. And that is, well, if it's a government of the people, and they're electing the representatives, and the representatives are reflecting the values and beliefs and desires of the constituencies, then how can government become oppressive or being tyrannical? Because government is us. They are merely doing what we want them to do. They're not oppressors. They're reflections of our values and desires and needs. And because government is no longer viewed as them, but rather viewed as us, we no longer see them as a threat. But the fact is, there are individuals who are power lusters. There are bureaucrats who live at the at the trough of government spending. And there are special interest groups who want to use the bureaucrats and the politicians to extract wealth for their private purposes outside of the, the direct mechanism of government itself. And that, that realization that government itself is an agency of force and the ability to either protect rights or violate rights has been lost. And we have to stop thinking of government as us, but at the end of the day, government as an instrument that can protect our rights, but is always a threat to us because of how it may serve the those in power and those who want to eat off what power can give them. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, in the best, one of the best proofs of this is the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights expressly protects the nation, the citizenry, from the federal government. Yes. Which which is proof positive we're dealing with two separate entities here. The government yes. and and the nation or the citizenry, yes. and and people often forget that in today's times. But boy, our ancestors clearly understood it because they enacted that Bill of Rights to protect us from the very same government that they brought into existence with the Constitution. Absolutely. Oh, okay, Richard. On that fine note, I greatly enjoyed the conversation as I did 34 years ago when we were starting FFF. And thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for your great support. And Richard, I look to, I look forward to seeing you next week. Until next time.